You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as um, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to Packers Total Access. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. If you'd like to email the show, you can send a message to Packers Total Access at gmail.com. Um, we're also giving away a uh, free autographed Quay Walker jersey, the away white jersey, Beckett style from pristineauction.com. Uh, has the certi- certificate of authenticity and all that stuff. Um, we're going to be giving that away to one lucky listener. All you got to do is go to my Twitter page at Packers underscore access. You will find a tweet that's pinned at the top of the page. Just retweet that tweet. Make sure you're following the account. That'll enter you into the contest one time. And the show is also brought to you by Fertile Ground Ranch Discipleship Ministry. It was birthed out of the burden to help those in our community and congregations who come out of a difficult past and addictive lifestyle. Um, with that same tweet that's pinned at the top of my Twitter page, you'll also see a link that's pinned to that uh, to donate to Fertile Ground Ranch Discipleship Ministry. If you would like to uh, uh, put money towards a, a good cause, you can donate to that. And for every five dollars that you do so, that'll enter you into the contest one additional time. So um, there's no limit on how many times you can donate uh, to that and be entered into that contest. You know, if you if you donate fifty dollars, that'll put you, uh, you know, 10 additional entries into that contest on top of retweeting that tweet and following the account. Also, if you're not on Twitter, completely understand if you're not, it can be somewhat toxic sometimes. Um, if you'd like to just email the show at Packers Total Access, or I'm sorry, Packers Total Access at gmail.com, you can just let me know, hey, I'd like to be entered in that contest. And just for listening to the show, we'll make sure that you get entered as well. So with all that being said, we're going to kick the show right off. And uh, obviously, Coming out of the postgame show last night, I want to say this. Thanks to everybody who dropped by. You guys were absolutely phenomenal in the chat. You know, I didn't agree with all of the comments in the chat, but what's so cool about our listeners, everybody was respectful. They gave me a lot of stuff to think about, which that's what really is the whole purpose of doing this show for me is I want to come away a better Packer fan and, and learning. And there's no better people, in my opinion, to learn from than fellow Packer fans. We've got the the most awesome fan base in all of the NFL, in my, my humble but accurate opinion. And um, I'm always just learning stuff from them. And and there's so many times that ideas are brought up that I otherwise wouldn't have even thought of. And that's where, uh, it, you know, like I always say, that the differing opinions are the ones that you learn from the most as long as you're not living in an echo chamber and just trying to pound a table to get your point across. And I, I refuse to listen to anyone else, all that garbage. So I really appreciate you guys dropping in. We got awesome feedback it was a good time, man. It started off kind of doom and gloom. You know, you're trying to cope with the loss there to the Lions, and it's as tough a loss as, as you're going to get. And, and me being an Aaron Rodgers fan, it was hard to watch him play his arguably the worst game of his career, right? It was just it was hard to see that happen. But we come into the postgame show, cut up a little bit, had a good time, came away talking about the facts of the of the game, you know, what went wrong, what went right, all that type of stuff, and, uh, and come away just uh, in a better mood because – you know, like we said on the on the pod or on the uh, on the pod in both the post game show, you know, we're we're stronger stronger together for sure, right? And in these dark times when your team's doing bad, it's nice to get together with fellow fans and go, you know what? You can laugh at yourself a little bit. It's okay. You can't accept the fact the team's underperforming. You know, it's 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 hard to uh, to deny that at this point, right? But there's no reason to just be down on it 
and try to argue with each other and try to you know push your agenda or your point across, whether you're an Aaron Rodgers hater or Aaron Rodgers lover, doesn't really matter. But when you do it in a sense to just try to prove people wrong and, and try to be a you know a little bit of a snark about it, I don't know, man. That's that's a, that's a rough way to live, right? But we're gonna kick off the show with an email from a listener, like I said. Um, got great feedback from the post game show, but this one came in a couple of days before the Lions game. And I thought it was really cool, man, because, you know, as I do the show, obviously I'm going to always try to find the positives in things. You know, I don't, I don't want to do a show and be miserable. I, I'm telling you guys, I took a, a spin through the, the Packers uh, podcast universe today and it was depressing. It was absolutely depressing. Just hearing the tone of people's voice. And I'm like, how are you letting this get you this down? Like, it's a down year. Absolutely. They're underperforming. I got it. But why do you want to be miserable? Right? Like, I, I, I don't understand it. And I'm always going to try to bring you the positive aspects. I'm going to I'm going to point out the negatives. And we're going to do that on Thursday. We move Chalk Talk to Thursday because I want access to the all 22s, the coaches film, all that stuff. And Coach Han's going to join me to, to highlight five plays. And three of those five plays were, were horrible. We're going to highlight all three of the Aaron Rodgers interceptions. And, you know, one of the reasons I did that is because I know there are going to be a select few people that go, oh, Clayton's always defending Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers can do no wrong. That's BS. A spade is a spade. He had a bad game. We're going to, we're going to dissect all three interceptions and talk about what he did wrong, period. And we're also going to highlight a, co- a couple good plays. But the reason we're highlighting the interceptions is because if, if you don't acknowledge what's wrong, how can you get better from it, right? Not as if we're actual coaches or players or in the organization, but I want this podcast to kind of mimic that. I want people to be able to learn the same as I'm learning as we go along, right? I want to be able to look at that footage and go, all right, what went wrong here? Was it a bad play call? Was it a bad pass read? What, Whatever the case may be, right? And we can kind of learn some terminology along the way and all that stuff. But this uh, email comes in from a listener, Brooke. I'm going to not say her last name in case she doesn't want it read, but Brooke emailed in and said, hi, Clayton. I literally just tweeted you uh, to add the email, and you did, like, right away. Love it. She actually asked in the bio of the uh, – um, or the description of each podcast, could you have the email added in there? And I mentioned it in the chat, and whether it was JJ or Ryan, whoever it was, did it immediately, which is awesome. But she said, I just wanted to thank you for being so positive. I love this podcast, and I really enjoy Ryan's pod and information and everything. He he makes me laugh. And I've learned so much over the years. I completely agree, Brooke. I, I've learned more from Ryan's podcast than anybody else's uh, as far as Packer podcasts go, that's for sure. But the Packernet after dark, and in quotations or in parentheses, she says, which I initially enjoyed and still do when we can when we can learn, has gotten too, quote, doom and gloom for me. I like to try to be optimistic. And when it seems like every other Packers podcast out there is so angry and so negative and has all but given up on the team in the season, I know I can listen to your pod and hear a glimmer of hope. You're realistic about it, which is important, but you're not negative, and I need that. Uh, I consider myself an emotional chameleon, meaning I tend to pick up whatever people around me are feeling. And after listening to the podcast after these last few games, I had to turn them off. I love this team. I have always loved this team. And I will be the first to admit we have been spoiled as a fan base. Well, you can't use that word right now. I'm going to tell you right now, Brooke, you use that word on Twitter. Lord have mercy, does it trigger people. If you refer to a Packer fan as being spoiled, they flip tables. And it's hilarious. I don't know why that triggers people. I, I would come back and honestly be like, yeah, I guess I am spoiled. I mean, we've done nothing but win the last 30 years. So maybe I am a little spoiled. But for whatever reason, boy, it gets hot. It's hot in the kitchen. So people aren't quite used to this. I grew up in Chicago in the 90s, so I got a lot of those. Those were the fans making fun of. I got a lot of hate from Bears fans around me. Always had to overcompensate my love for the team sticking up for being a fan. But I usually, with the exception of of a few seasons, had a team that was backing me up because they were better than the other teams. The irony that person, you can be the greatest wide receiver ever And if you're a toxic person, I don't want you anywhere near my team. I just don't look at those guys as players. I look at them as humans, and I've always kind of thought of them as family. That's so cool. So when people attack my team or make fun of my team, I take it kind of personally. It's silly, I know, but it's who I am, and I'm happy to love them. Um, Yeah, just kind of talking about defending your team, defending your players, and and, and I look at it the same way, and – 
you know, doing a podcast, I've had an opportunity to talk to several, several family members. You know, what's cool is I got to speak to, you know, obviously uh, Crystal Watson, um, Christian Watson's mom. What an amazing woman she is. Just a, a great conversation talking about the struggles they had, you know, being a single mom and, and trying to make it to all the games and this and that. And how Christians work so hard to get to where he's at. And um, that's why it's so hard when you see people tweet stuff out. And it's, it's so insensitive that someone, guys, you're talking about a concussion. Like, as if he can prevent getting a concussion. Are we really going to call somebody fragile? Are we really going to say, oh, they're injury prone because they got a concussion? Are you serious? And if, if you're one of those people, and I'm just going to be real, if you're one of those people and you feel like that, go watch the movie Concussion and then come back and talk to him. When you see what, what Mike Webster went through the last couple years of his life, longer than that, but especially the last couple years of his life, absolutely tortured soul from the brain damage. When you hear about how a junior say I'll distance himself from his family and ended up taking his own life. We hear all these players that have taken their, their lives and in some cases shot themselves in the chest so they could protect their brain so it could be studied to prove that CTA is a CTE is a real thing and not just something that that quote unquote soft fans have have drummed up, right? Like it's important. It's important to mention those things. So I'm just to be real, how dare you call a person soft because they got a concussion? And if you're listening to the pod and you're one of those guys, unsubscribe to the pod, unfollow me on Twitter, and go about your merry way because I'm sorry, there's no tolerance for it. These are human beings. And immediately people say, oh, well, they get paid millions of dollars. Okay, what's that got to do with you? And what's that got to do with their mental health? They've worked their butts off their entire life to get to this point, to have a shot, to be one of the select few, to have an opportunity, in some cases, to drag their family out of a crappy situation financially. And, and you're going to sit there and call them soft because they got a concussion? Like, how stupid are you? And, and I think what ticks me off the most, I didn't plan on going this route, but here we are and we're going to finish up with it. What ticks me off the most is people will say that hiding behind a computer screen. People will say that typing on a keyboard, but you can bet your rear end they wouldn't say it to that player's face. Ain't a chance in you know what. Just like the media sit in front of the players and just and completely try to prod and pick at them constantly. They do it with the coaches. You know, one of the things that stood out to me, and he's an announcer now, gosh, what, what's his name? Uh, Jason Garrett was, was the head coach in Dallas. Whether you think he was a good coach or not, I, I, I could care less, to be honest with you. I mean, he made it to the NFL level and stuck for quite some time. He was a backup quarterback in the NFL. He made a comment a couple of years ago when he was the offensive coordinator, I believe, in, in New York with the Giants, when, when a reporter just said, you know, called him by his name, yeah, Jason, and he said, it's coach. Like, I personally feel like they've earned the right to be called coach. Guys, I have Coach Hahn on here. You notice I call him Coach you know why I call him coach? Because he spent his entire life, as soon as he became an adult, saying, I want to, I want to impact young men, in some cases young women, through coaching and make their life better and let them know that somebody gives a crap about them. I'm going to make them a better person, a better athlete, a better student, the whole nine yards. You're damn right I'm going to call him coach. And when a media member goes, huh, he thinks he he thinks I have to call him coach, shut up. Shut, go push your pencil back in the office and pretend like your opinion matters more than everybody else's. It's ridiculous. And it's soft is what it is. You're hiding behind a microphone. You're hiding behind a media badge. You're hiding behind a podcast. You're hiding behind a Twitter feed thinking you're a tough guy saying that somebody's weak because they got a concussion. It's ridiculous. So, Brooke, you got me on one. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. She says, sorry that email got a little long. I just wanted to tell you you're doing a great job. You're willing to learn and not uh, not stuck in your opinion. And I think that leads other people into doing the same. Thank you for being a lot in a dark season. Oh, and don't hide your, quote, redneck quips. <laughs> they may be silly, but they're fun to listen to. And they're who you are. Keep being you, smart and kind. Go, Pat, go, Brooke. Brooke, I, I appreciate the kind words. I really do. And thank you for accepting me for the redneck self that I am. It is what it is. <laughs> and I'm 40 years old. There ain't no change in it now, right? Yeah, it is. I mean, if you heard my wife speak, you would think that I talked like Margaret Thatcher. It's hilarious. She's got the best Southern draw, the best Southern accent. It's people, when we walk into a room, they just want to hear her talk, and it's hilarious. But, uh, again, Brooke, thank you so much for being a kind soul. You're a lot in this season, you know, just the same as you said for me. People like you make me want to uh, be more positive and, and, and learn more and all those things. I really appreciate your time. So, 
um, getting back into the show. I just want to read that email. Somebody takes a, that much time to, to, to write out a long drawn out email. I'm going to take time to read it on the air because I owe it to them. I do. And I appreciate your support. So Aaron Rodgers, you know, the big thing, the big talk is Aaron Rodgers' body language. You heard us talk about on the post game show and it got a little bit animated there for a bit. We can agree to disagree. It's totally cool. Uh, and you heard me say over and over, I wish he wouldn't act the way he does on the field, but at the same time, it, it, you can't take every little thing he does and just assume, okay, yeah, he's blaming his teammates because he wasn't doing that the whole nine yards, right? Um, it wasn't like every time he he had a uh, you know an outburst on the field, it happened. You know, I pointed out three weeks ago he was laughing and cutting up with AJ Dillon, Aaron Jones on the sideline. They were losing. He got bashed for that. He gets upset, gets mad. He gets bashed for that. If he doesn't do anything walking off the field, it's look, he don't even care. I mean, wh what are they supposed to do? Right now, do I wish he had a better attitude? Absolutely. But I don't know. I don't know what's on his shoulders. I don't know what's going on in his personal life, nor do you. Right. And, and I don't know, man. I just have a hard what I what I have no tolerance for is people who 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 tend to put themselves over the team, meaning I'm going to do something that's going to hurt the team. And I don't care if it helps the team or not. Period. I'm just going to do what's best for me. You know. You're, I don't want to start mentioning names because it might take other fan bases off. And I'm not here to create division. I want to create unity. But there's plenty of examples. You can go find them and see them doing setups in their in their uh, driveway and trying to get traded to other teams and doing that. You know, faking injuries so they get traded, all that stuff. So Aaron Rodgers, he doesn't take uh, ownership, right? That's been the big talk. He doesn't take ownership. He blames everybody else. Well, this is the second week in a row where he's taking ownership, right? And I just glossed over it last week, didn't mention it. I'm going to play a soundbite from his presser. Just understand I'm not going to play the part that had bad language, okay? It initially started with him saying, I had I had some crappy throws for sure, right? Meaning the interceptions were on him. So I fast-forwarded past that part. It's just a brief clip. I want, to, I want you to hear what he had to say. Here we go. Um, yeah, the kid made a nice one down the middle, but the other two. The kid made a, a nice one down the middle talking about the pass to Tony. And if you watch it, that safety, that was not the safety's responsibility. He read Aaron's eyes, completely jumped the route. Still a bad throw. Aaron was pressing. He shouldn't have been pressing. That's my opinion. He just gave credit to the defender for making a great play on that one. You know, I probably should have just checked out of that play. And probably should have checked out of that play saying, I had us in the wrong play. Hand the ball off or adjusted the route in the first one. Should have handed the ball off. And then, uh, yeah, I just was a little off balance and threw a bad one to Dave in the back. A little off balance and threw a bad one to Dave in the back, talking about the, the play design to the injured left tackle, right? He took ownership of every single thing, everything. So here we are. I made some crappy throws, right? Yeah, I probably shouldn't have threw the other one. The, the kid made a great play on it. The other one I should have checked out of and went to the run but I stayed in the past. He's saying everything that his critics are saying, but they don't want to acknowledge that he's taking ownership of it. Worst game I've ever seen Aaron Rodgers play. Be the first to say it. Worst game. So, so what do we do? Just pile on him? Is this your quarterback? Is this the quarterback of your team? Is this the, the person that's been on your roster longer than anyone else on the entire team? He and Mason. Is this – so that's how you treat him. Got it. He's taking ownership. Let's just pile on. I'm watching Twitter roll, and every little mistake that he made, they're trying to find every little clip and go, hey, that's right here it is. Look, see, Aaron sucks. Okay, Aaron's having a bad year, but Aaron doesn't suck. Yesterday, Aaron sucked, period. No doubt about it. He's right here in front of God and everybody telling you he had a bad game. But for whatever reason, you go to Twitter and you search Aaron Rodgers, it'll be nothing but blaming his teammates, this and that. And I did that poll for a reason because the loud people are typically the ones that come across as the majority, right? And that poll showed me that roughly 70% of Green Bay Packer fans are still on Aaron Rodgers' side, and they still got his back, and that's QB1, and we're going to ride or die with him, right? Um, so probably shouldn't even be giving it this much life. But I just wanted to point out here on the podcast – Aaron has taken ownership of that game. He took ownership of his play and how crappy it was. So when other people tell you, well, he just blames everybody else, go, oh, I'm sorry, you must not have heard the post-game presser, huh? Because he took ownership. So 
I wanted to point that out to kick things off. Now, let's get into some grades. Let's talk about what actually went good and went bad in that game. That's what we're here for, right? We want to learn from each game and understand where the team's at, where we need to go, what we can build off of, all those things, right? So at the Detroit Lions, the PFF grades are in. Overall, they got a 61.2. To put that into perspective, that's their third worst game of the year. They actually said that they played worse overall against the Jets and the Minnesota Vikings, okay? So 61.2. Um, offensively, a 62.5. That looks like their fourth worst game of the year, okay? So definitely wasn't their worst game offensively. You know, what's crazy is I felt like they moved the ball really, really well. The statistics, you know, kind of back that up. You know, Aaron, if Aaron had not thrown the three interceptions, and I know if if some butts were candies and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. Or as Darius Butler says, if ifs were fists, we'd all be drunk. Right. I get it. The three interceptions were the worst thing that Aaron Aaron Rodgers could do in that game. I'm not denying that. But if you took those three interceptions away, you would look at that and go, Aaron really moved the ball well. He threw the ball pretty good. Now, did he miss reads? Absolutely he missed reads. 100 percent he missed reads. Not denying that. But if we're going to look at just the however many negative plays and not even focus on the positive at all, then you're already throwing a skewed, you know, assessment of the game out there, in my opinion. But offensively, 62.5. Passing uh, grade for the, the Packers as a whole, 59.9. That was, to the best of my knowledge, the third worst game. He played worse against the Giants and he played worse against the Vikings as far as the passing game as a whole. Pass blocking was actually pretty good this game, 77.7. And, guys, that gives me hope. Now, I know David Bakhtiari left there in the second half, but it tells me that Zach Tom is starting to come along. He played left guard, then they moved him to left tackle, if I understood correctly. It tells me that you guys remember me early in the season going, I don't know if Yash can move to right tackle. I don't know how interchangeable that is. Right? I don't know if he can do that, right? Well, it looks like Yash is kind of coming along pretty good, right? Elton graded out good. Right. So, there, I mean, there's a, a lot of things to kind of to kind of pull from this. Right. Like pass blocking grade, 77 point seven to me. Let's see here. Let's look here. It's uh, that was their third best pass blocking game of the year. Granted, Detroit has a horrible defense. It's worth mentioning that for sure. But I was kind of pleasantly surprised with how the offensive line played. That's what was so hard to accept about Aaron's bad game. And it's kind of what we've talked about all year long is how the team can never put it all together. Right. It just seems like there's always one or two things that are off when this when this aspect of the game picks up. When Aaron has a good game, the you know, the running the running game doesn't show up or the receivers might not show up. When when Aaron has a bad game, all of a sudden the pass blocking was good and he had time to throw. But he, he missed reads. He missed throws. Right. It's just hard to put everything together. Um, receiving grade, 58.7. Took a took a big step back. That's their second worst game of the year. As a whole, now you got to take into consideration Romeo Dobbs had one snap, he left with an injury, right? And we're going to talk about injuries here in a little bit, but it's definitely worth mentioning that receiving wise, this was their third worst game. And like I said, um, you know, it, I think in, in part, I mean, you're without Randall Cobb, right? Romeo Dobbs goes out early. Christian Watson leaves the game, I think, after 13 snaps, if I remember correctly. So you're back to the backups again. You know, injuries is what's really, really hurt this team and prevented them from creating continuity. You want to know the difference between last year and this year outside of Devontae Adams? It's injuries, in my opinion. I, I just – at least last year you didn't have this constant rotation. You know, with David Bakhtiari having to go in and out, you could kind of settle in and go, okay, here's who's actually going to be playing. Um, but, again, receiving grade, 58.7. Running grade, 74.5. Took – Took quite a step back from the 90.8 the previous week. However, still a pretty solid grade there with the run, which which is amazing to me because that tells me the run blocking must have been really bad because, you know, I've got the stats here. Um, you know, like I said, Aaron accepting blame, right? Accepting, you know, basically saying, hey, look, I made the crappy throws. I made the bad decisions. I made the wrong checks. This game's on me. A.J. Dillon only 3.1 yards per carry. You notice how nobody online who's been screaming, run the D-ball, run the D-ball, run the D-ball, nobody's pointing out those statistics. You notice how that, that's going? 3.1 yards per carry for A.J. Dillon. Aaron Jones, probably, well, what did Aaron Jones have then? 2.8 yards per carry. 2.8. Come through Twitter and show me the guys that are bashing the running backs for having a bad game, right? And if you look at it, you go, okay, PFF says it was a 74.5, then that means it must have been the offensive line's run blocking. 
Would you agree? I would. Okay, run blocking grade, 53.2. 53.2 was a run blocking grade. That explains why you couldn't crack three yards per carry from the running backs, right? And then on top of that, the receiving grade being a 58.7, right? Everything was off yesterday. It's not Aaron Rodgers. It's not Matt LaFleur. It's not the receivers. It's not the offensive line. It's all of them. It's everything globally. It's just everything is off this year. And, you know, I went back and I watched the Patriots uh, condensed uh, replay, watched all their snaps twice because they're implementing this wide boot scheme into their offense and are doing kind of a hybrid version. And their offense is struggling bad. Bill Belichick picked the wrong year to implement that because that wide boot scheme is really struggling other than the hybrid versions that you see, you know, in Seattle, in Miami. Two, in my opinion, two is your MVP right now. Think about that. I mean, somebody said it the other day in the chat, man, go home, NFL, you're drunk this year. And it really feels that way. But as far as the receiving grade, you can't expect much because look at look at all the players that were injured. Look at the players that were injured, the receivers that were injured going in, and then look at the receiver, receivers that got hurt during the game. I mean, you lost again two of your top receivers in Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs. Not their fault. And, and we found out, and I'll read it here in a minute, exactly what was said, but Christian Watson didn't have a concussion. But you guys know after the Tua incident where they put him back in the game when he shouldn't have been back in the game, he got another concussion in the next game uh, that following week. Everybody's being overly cautious. Christian Watson basically got the wind knocked out of him, the best of my knowledge, got up slow, and they said, hey, look, that's enough for us. Get him off the field. Get him off the field. Let's protect that brain. And I am 100% in agreement with that. That's somebody's kid, right? As somebody's brother, like we we especially somebody that young, man. Like you gotta protect, you gotta protect everybody of all ages. But you, I'm telling you, if you haven't watched it, go watch Concussion. Go watch Concussion and then come back and tell me I'm being a baby about it. Because I, I'm telling you, dude, it tore me up. I used to be that fan. It was like, man, they're ruining the game. This is so soft. Blah blah blah. I watched Concussion. I came back. You'll never hear me complain again. Somebody shows signs of concussion, get them out of the game. Because that is sad. What that man went through. Multiple guys went through. Yeah, the the Pittsburgh Steelers offensive lineman that slowly lost his mind. To the best of my knowledge, he had a little bit of a, a friendship there with Mike Webster, and, and he kind of knew what Mike went through, and he was going through it slowly. Literally got in his vehicle, said that – I think he said that demons were chasing him, drove into oncoming traffic on purpose, hit a tanker, and died. But, yeah, yeah, Christian Watson's soft. Shut up. Like, blows my mind. So the receiving grade, 58.7, right? What a lot of people don't want to mention is there were 10 different receivers that caught passes in that game. 10. Guys, 10 different Green Bay Packers players caught passes. There was actually passes thrown to 12 different players. That shows you the rotation going in and out of that game and, and them trying to patch this together through the injuries, right? Samori Torre, to me, I think we might have something there. It's still early, but I don't know. He just shows – he seems like the moment's not too big for him. He had that drop. Some would say the, the pass was inaccurate. Aaron was running for his life to the right, threw off the – you know, off platform, obviously. To me, it looked like a catchable ball. I'll have to go back and watch the All-22 and make sure, you know, to, that it wasn't crazy inaccurate. But, again, 10 different receivers. I bet you didn't see that on Twitter today, right? 12 attempts to 12 different players, but and one of those was Bakhtiari. If you want to remove that and then say 11, right? But it just kind of shows you who the receivers were. Now, let's move on to defense. Defensively, this surprised me because I honestly felt like the defense played good. I did. I may feel completely different when I go look at the tape, but usually I got a pretty good beat on. Oh, no, the defense showed up pretty good. Their defensive grade overall was a 56.9, their run defense grade was a 56.6. Just horrible. I mean, when you look at these grades starting at week one, guys, run defense, 48.5, 38.0, 60.1, 50.0, 60.4, 48.4. Against Washington, a 78.6. Buffalo Bills, 56.7. And then last week, this, this game a couple days ago there, Detroit Lions, 56.6. Run defense is just, man, it, it's, it's depressing. Tackle grade, 68.5. You know, you're probably going, man, that sucks. Well, last week it was a 29.8, so they really improved there. Pass rush grade, 73.5, albeit 
you know, with the loss of Gary, we'll talk about it in a minute, but um, pass rush grade came out pretty good at a 73.5. Coverage grade, 51.5. Once again, oh, what I thought was going to be one of the strengths of this defense from everything that was said coming out of camp with Russell Douglas and how cocky Jair was and Eric Stokes ready to, to take another step. And, and you know, we lost Eric Stokes, obviously, to injury. It sounded pretty bad. We'll talk about it here in a second. 51.5, man, shut up and play ball, guys. Like, focus on your assignments. Focus on what the game plan is. You know, Jair got the pick. I get it. You know, it was a great play, right? And um, I wish I had the box score pulled up. Everything happened so fast. I haven't had a chance to really go back and study anything yet. Um, I'm going to do that tomorrow night. But um, he might he might have even had two interceptions. But I know – I think there was one there that was pick six. Everything's just such a blur, man. That game was – God, it was interesting to watch. But, again, 51.5 ain't going to get it done. Special team, 67.5. So just wanted to kind of hit on those. Let's move individually and see what the grades were as far as, you know, who graded out well um, for the offense. Let's start with the offense. I got really excited when I seen this. Romeo Dobbs at the top of the list, 88.4 elite grade. Only problem was it was only one snap. So I'm sorry you got to throw that out the window. Number two to 78.2. Elton Jenkins, 74 snaps, and he graded out a 78.2. Elton Jenkins is slowly getting back to his original self, in my opinion. Okay? I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not uh, as simple you know, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the icon of vacations. Icon of the seas. Arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry Bahamas. Number three, check this out. Zach Tom, 72.8. I mean, that is great news, guys. Zach Tom is, is progressing every single week, and that's exciting to me. Christian Watson. 17 snaps, right? Kind of a small sample size, left the game. Precautionary reasons, thinking it might have been another concussion. Great out as a 72.6. I think we've got something in Christian Watson. We just got to keep him on the field. And if there's one thing that I want Christian Watson to adjust or learn, it's how to play on the field and protect yourself because that guy is just wide open. And that's not a bad thing. Like, you know, when I see a player – that catches a short pass across the middle, runs full speed into a linebacker, a safety in a corner, lowers his head. I don't think he's soft. I'm sorry for all those that are saying he's soft out there. 
that's a freaking warrior, dude. You're, you're willing to lower your head, especially with the small frame he has, being a, a tall, slimmer guy, and being able to put his body on the line like that and saying, dude, I'm do whatever's best for the team. Here it is, bam. And then he leaves the game, and we got fans calling him soft. Like, I think, I think we got something there. He's just got to learn how to protect himself at this level because the last thing you want is somebody that young having to deal with injuries for personal reasons, not even football reasons, right? And if you don't like that, if this isn't football enough for you and I've got too much heart towards a player, then, oh, well, man, find another pod. Like, that's that's me as a person. That's I'm going to call it as I see it. I would say the same thing about Aaron. I would say the same thing about Jair. You know, I've been critical of Jair being cocky and running his mouth against the Bills and us getting torched and then, you know, coming out this week and getting a personal foul and this and that. I don't want to see Jair get hurt. If he gets a concussion, you're not going to hear me going, hey, you see cocky Jair soft. No, it's a human being. Like, I don't know, man. Maybe I maybe I take that stuff too personal. Number five, John Runyon, 68.6. Number six, Aaron Jones, 67.9. Number seven, David Bottiari, 65.5. Took a little bit of a step back there. Um, yeah, now let's go to kind of the bad ones. You know, who graded out bad? 60 snaps for Sammy Watkins, 46.3, guys. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. Samori Torre, 48.1. Only 28 snaps, but a 48.1. Took a huge step back. So we got to kind of check. I, speaking to myself, I got to really slow my roll there. Yash Nijman took a step back. He had 74 snaps at right tackle, but a 57.7. Not going to get it done, right? Not going to get it done. Um, let's see here. Another one, Josiah DeGuara, 58.1. Uh, A.J. Dillon, 58.2. Royce Newman only had one snap. I won't even mention it. Alan Lazard, 60.9. God, I hate to admit it, guys, but we got to get us a we got to get us a good receiver this coming offseason. We've got to make it happen. I didn't think it was a top priority. I really didn't. I thought that Matt LaFleur's scheme, his system, we'd be able to scheme people open and we could go with – you know, uh, what I call, quote, good wide receivers. I felt like we had a wide receiver core that was full of number two receivers. The the PFF grades don't suggest it. Neither do the stats. Neither does the tape, in my opinion. So, And, and people will come back and go, well, it's because Aaron Rodgers ain't throwing to them when they're open. Okay, I, I got it. Put it on the list. It's Aaron Rodgers' fault that they're not developing. Got it. Okay. Aaron Rodgers, 63.0. Again, I think that, me personally, I think that that is – too reasonable of a grade. I expected him in the 50s. I was surprised that he was in a he was a 63. I thought the interceptions would just would tank his grade completely out. PFF suggests otherwise. But again, if you remove the three interceptions, you know, maybe he had a pretty decent game. He made three boneheaded plays there. I know he missed uh, Deguara, who was open open on the middle there for uh, for one potential big gainer. He didn't see him, didn't go to him. Whatever you want to say, I don't know. I'm not in his brain. I'm not going to pretend like I can read his mind. A lot of people like to go on Twitter and say, see, you don't want to throw to him. I don't know that he don't want to throw to him. Maybe, I mean, unless you can see his eyes and exactly what he's looking at, maybe he had moved on to a different read, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent. It is what it is, right? So there's that. That's the offensive grades. Let's move on to defense. Defensively, this was kind of cool. It was only 15 snaps, but Isaiah McDuffie, 91.1, and his run defense grade, 90.3. You guys know <clears throat> he was – Helping fill in for Devondre Campbell's absence, and um, McDuffie's kind of kind of coming on there. You know, you you know, early in the season, I haven't checked it in a while, but he was leading in special teams grade, which is very very important with this team. Which isn't it funny? The special teams didn't let us down. This is the game that Aaron Rodgers let us down. It's what I'm saying. Like it's when you patch things together just enough, it's like one you know something else starts leaking. But Isaiah McDuffie though, that's. That was kind of – that's something to look for moving forward. Like, okay, let's see what we got there. Let's see him a little bit more. Uh, Rashawn Gary, 88.4. And it's so sad, man. Only 28 snaps. Obviously, he left with a bad knee injury. Uh, spoiler alert, we'll mention it again here in a minute, but he's out for the season, right? It is what it is. Russell Douglas, 77.1. <clears throat> Love that guy. He's a dog. I'm so glad he's on the roster for the next three years, including this year. You know, the next two after this. Excuse me, I had to get a drink there. <clears throat> I'm glad Russell's in the uh, short-term, you know, plans for the Packers here for the next uh, the next two years outside of this year. Jonathan Garvin, 20 snaps, a 74.6, not bad at all. Played pretty decent run defense at a 68.0, not great, but held his own. Tackle grade, 70.5. Um, yeah, so uh, pretty solid solid there by Jonathan Garvin. Who knows, man, we might, might see some of these guys step up in, in Rashawn Gary's absence. Jair Alexander, 68.9. But you're going, 
But what about the interceptions? That's all I love about PFF, man. You could see interceptions and go, man, he had a great game. But every other snap, if he played crappy, not saying he did, that the the you know grade suggests he played kind of just middle of the pack, you know, nothing great, but nothing horrible. Um, that's what I love about PFF, man. They look at every single snap and not just the flash plays, right? You can look at the interception column and go, that's the interception leader in the NFL. He's the best corner in the league. Wrong. If he's screwing up his assignment, you know, multiple times per game, that's not helping the team. That's hurting them. Who cares if you got an interception every now and then, right? But Jair, 68.9. Dean Lowry had 37 snaps, 67.0. That's just Dean right there, man. Dean's always going to be right there around 70, nothing more, nothing less, just right there in that ballpark. You know what you got with Dean. He's one of those consistent players for sure. Eric Stokes only had 10 snaps before he had a gruesome injury, 66.8. Not a horrible grade, but it is what it is. But, again, the safeties, guys, Adrian Amos, 64.1. And then the slide down to – um, Darnell Savage, 60.1. The safeties are the biggest hole in this defense. Now, Preston Smith had a bad game, had 50 snaps. Tackle grade, again, 28.8. Really struggling to bring the ball carrier down or, or make sound tackles. Run defense, 44.5. His pass rush grade was a 78.7, but overall, 56.4. TJ Slayton, excuse me, 50.8. It's just about time to accept the fact that TJ Slayton is probably not going to be a starter in this league. I know we loved his size. I liked it more than anything, you know, but um, Quay Walker had green dot duties. You know, he was taking the um, uh, taking the play calls in there with the headset. 46.0, guys. A 33.2 tackle grade. He was in my notes. You know, we didn't even cover the notes because we had a packed house last night and wanted to get everybody's opinion on the game rather than just, you know, reading off notes. But Quay Walker really flashed to me as a, just horrible at tackling. I've got it in my notes literally on a, on, a, on a flat pass and then on another run, miss tackle, miss tackle. Um, got to hope he picks it up. Again, he's a rookie, put in kind of a tough spot going in as, a, as an initial starter. We thought we were going to have something, you know, a superstar in the making right there off the bat, not saying he couldn't be, but another rough game for uh, Quay Walker with a 46.0. Jaron Reed had a real bad game, 42.3. Really thought that he was starting to settle in, not the case at all. So the, I think the biggest concern here – it's Kenny Clark, though. 32.8, guys. His run defense grade is a 29.9. All I can think about, too, is how excited I was to see him trim weight off going into training camp and thinking, yeah, he's going get to the, get after the quarterback this year, and he has. Not in this game, but he has here in this uh, this season so far. But 29.9 run defense grade, man. That's I mean, you you sort it. When you sort it by run defense from, from Sunday's game, Kenny Clark, 29.9. Jaron Reed, 37.4. Preston Smith, 44.5. TJ Slayton, 53.0. Devontae Wyatt, 56.0. Man, it's kind of surprising seeing that, you know, they they held the line to so whatever it was, you know, however many points, 15 points or whatever it was. And, and it, granted, they were on the field a lot because we kept turning the ball over. I get it. But uh, got to take the good with the bad. So just wanted to cover those. And make sure that we uh, we hit on all that and uh, gave you a little bit better idea of who graded out good, who graded out bad, and all that stuff. So let's go to the updated team grades real quick, okay, if I can get it to pull up here. So I like to kind of compare the overall PFF grades to the rest of the league, okay? And overall, as a team, the Packers have now dropped to 18th. Now, obviously, I'm not surprised by that because you keep tacking on injuries every single week and the grades continue to plummet, right? And you're starting to lose hope for the playoffs, right? They're still, you know, technically in the hunt. It's going to take a lot of things going right. And without Rashawn Gary, it's going to be going to be tough road to hoe, right? Offensively, the Packers grade out as 15th best team. Passing-wise, the Packers grade out as the 10th best team. Okay, and I know, I know the Aaron Rodgers or haters are rolling their eyes right now, like, oh, God. Pass blocking. You know, think about that passing grade. Pass blocking, 73.4. They come in sixth, so that's a bright spot, right? Pass blocking is getting better as the season goes along, and that's great. The only problem is the receiving grade. Receiving grade is now plummeted to 28th. PFF says that the Packers only have one, two, three, four teams in the entire NFL that's worse at receiving than our receiving crew. You know, do with that what you want. Running grade. Our running back's ability to run the ball, 
right? Given, you know, whatever it has, whatever it is they have as far as protection in the run blocking game, but the running backs themselves, or, you know, even Aaron, when he ran the ball, you know, he had a huge third, third and long pick up there with his legs. I'd like to see a little bit more than more of that um, moving forward. I don't know. I just, I think that teams have to play you a little bit different. You know, they have to play the Josh Allens a little bit different. They have to play Pat Mahomes a little bit different. Lamar Jackson, obviously. I'm not saying Aaron is on that scrambling ability at this stage of his career, but when a defense has to account for that stuff, man, it really changes the game plan in real time. But running grade, Green Bay is third in the entire NFL in running grade. Well, why don't we run the ball more? Again, 3.1 a carry from Dylan, 2.8 from Jones. Well, how's the running grade so great? Because they're taking into account how bad the run blocking is and how they adjusted, right? Did they do their job to the best of their ability with what was in front of them, right? Well, Green Bay's run blocking is 24th in the league. 24th, guys. There's only eight other teams or seven teams, I believe. Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight other teams that are worse at run blocking than the Packers. Okay, so that explains that to me. It's not the running backs. It's the run blocking. Now, when you look at that, when you look at the run blocking grades, okay, and just kind of go down the line here and say, okay, who's really struggling to run block? The New York Jets are the fifth worst, 54.1. Wide, wide zone boot. That's that's Mike LaFleur, Matt's brother. Okay. You slide down to, let's see here, the Packers are ninth worst, right? According to this, 55.5. Wide zone boot. Tenth worst. LA Rams, 57.3. You seen a trend? San Francisco 49ers, 12th worst, 58.2. Seattle Seahawks, another one that runs the wide boat, the wide boot scheme, right? The wide zone boot, a little bit modified out there with their offensive coordinator that came from the L.A. Rams a, a couple of years ago. Seattle Seahawks, though, 58.4. They're 14th worst. You're starting to see that trend. People are catching on to this running game, and the ones that aren't adapting are really paying for it. That's my opinion. All right, let's move on to defensively. Defensively, overall defense, the Packers grayed out as the 19th best team. Okay, not great, but definitely not in the top tier, not in the top half, right? Um Run defense, this one hurts. Run defensively, 22nd in the league, okay? Tackle grade. Tackling-wise, the Green Bay Packers are 21st in the league with a grade of 48.9. Horrible. Pass rushing, we're 6th in the league in pass rush. I expect that to start to, start to drop a little bit now with Rashawn Gary gone. But, again, they're sixth in the league right now to 77.4. Coverage grade. Green Bay Packers are 11th in coverage. And then special teams, the one that we all love, Green Bay Packers are 25th with a 62.8. So just want to kind of give you, like I said, a little update on exactly, um, you know, kind of where they land ranking-wise, where's the strengths, where are the weaknesses. Why do we mention that? It's not to be negative. It's so we can take note and go, okay, Here's the things that PFF is suggesting we need to get better at. So if if we're now almost halfway through the season and these things haven't been corrected, they haven't been fixed, now it's time to start giving reps to other people, especially as we get closer to the playoffs and it's looking like we're probably not going to make the playoffs, right? So I think it's important to talk about that. I think it's important to kind of look and see who's on – like, like uh, Isaiah McDuffie having a great game. Uh, one I didn't mention was Chris Barnes who had a horrible game. And we were kind of expecting Chris Barnes coming off hour. Will he play a role, blah, blah, blah. To me, that suggests give McDuffie the snaps. Give McDuffie the snaps and see if we really got something there or not. If it starts to plummet, then you know, okay, just have one flash in a pan, and that's great. Make your notes, move on for building the roster next year, and you know who's the strengths, who's the weaknesses. That's how you find these guys on the bottom of the roster and realize what it is they can do good. You know, that's just kind of the way I look at it. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. So let's move on to some injury news before we get ready to wrap up here. Rob Domofsky said uh, yesterday, he said, Matt LaFleur said Rashawn Gary is, quote, a, tre a tremendous loss, confirming that he's done for the season. LaFleur said he can't rule out the possibility that other injuries from yesterday aren't season ending. So there may be other season ending injuries. We haven't ruled that out yet. On Christian Watson, though, LaFleur said test showed it was not another concussion. Praise God. Thank God that that, that guy, that kid, because that's what he is to me. I mean, he's, he's, it's a child out there, in my opinion. You always a grown man. Well, okay, I got it. But 
That's, I don't know, man. I just look at it different. That's somebody's kid. I promise you that. Um, it wasn't any additional brain damage, right? Which is great news. Awesome. Um, but they did hold him out for precautionary reasons. Kudos to the Packers training staff for doing the right thing right there and protecting that guy. On Aaron Jones's injury, there's the potential he could play versus Dallas. He was trying to get back in the game yesterday. So when he jogged off to the tunnel, I guess the MRIs came back negative, if I understood correctly. They had him in a walking boot. Maybe that was precautionary to prevent swelling. Um, but they're saying there's a good chance he could play against Dallas, so that's good news there. Uh, LaFleur added that Eric Stokes' ankle slash knee is the other injury that's potentially the, the most serious among the others who were injured yesterday. Matt LaFleur said, okay, and that's just requoting that. So it sounds like Eric Stokes is most likely is the uh, is season ending. Okay. That's what it's seeming like. I'm not, I'm not saying I hope that, but that's what it sounds like. There's a good chance that his uh, did end his season as well. So, you know, it sucks for Stokes. I hate it. You know, you want to see the guy perform. You want to see him improve and get those meaningful reps and all that, but it's next man, next man up now. All right, let's see what we got behind him. Right. Uh, you know, I, I'm a lot more sensitive toward the concussion stuff rather than ankles and knees. Not that, not that you know, it, it's not stressful or, or you know, puts a, a young player in a bad position, especially in a contract year or something like that. You don't want to see anybody hurt, but the concussion stuff really, really bothers me, man, because you're talking about long-term, long-term health and, and the suicide rate with CTE and all that stuff is just crazy, crazy. Uh, it bothers me, so. Um, just wanted to give you kind of an update on the injuries there. That's the best that we have at the moment. So now as we get ready for Dallas, right, um, we're getting ready to wrap the pot up. Again, I just wanted to kind of bring you guys some some different things. Let's talk about what how the grades hit. Let's talk about, you know, who played well, who played bad, where they rank across the league, all that good stuff. But we got Dallas coming in, and that means Mike McCarthy. And um, I just want to say this, man. I have a lot of respect for Mike McCarthy. Um, when they let him go, you know, obviously I wasn't a part of the Packer net. Uh, you know, I wasn't doing podcasts at the time. I was a fan, just like all you guys listen to my voice. I still am a fan, still love Packer net podcasts and listen to all the other podcasts and all that, uh, as much as I ever have. Um, I just, you know, I wasn't around to give my opinion on Mike McCarthy when he was let go guys. It's funny that when you hear me defend Matt LaFleur, because I, I definitely, I'm, I'm definitely a Matt, Matt Lafleur defender. I, I defend him more, more than I don't. Right, but when they let McCarthy go, I was livid. I was like, that man deserves better than that to be fired mid-season. I was one of those fans. Now, was I saying I'm not going to root for the Packers? Absolutely not. Right, and whatever the decisions made, and it's time to get behind the team. I get it, but I was one of those guys that really, really appreciated Mike McCarthy and. And, and thought he, he should have a shot to try to right the ship and get maybe one more year. Now, some people say that Aaron had him ran out of town. I have no reason to think that that's true other than a lot of people believe that and, you know, take that as you will, right? But I do remember Aaron saying, listen, for all the Packer fans out there, this guy still lives in Green Bay. He's still got a family in Green Bay. His wife's from Green Bay. So if you see him, treat him good. He's done a lot for this organization, you know, like Aaron came out and said that, but the media is, Oh, Aaron got him fired. Aaron got him ran out. Maybe he did. I don't know. Right. I don't know all the details. I just know if it wasn't for Mike McCarthy, I truly believe Aaron Rodgers wouldn't be the quarterback. He is. Everybody acts like Aaron Rodgers was a slam dunk. Number one, overall pick guys, a lot of teams passed up on Aaron Rodgers. And I remember going into year four, People were still saying he's a – I remember when they used the second-round pick to draft Brian Brom because they still didn't know if Aaron was the answer. Think about that. Think about the fact they used a second-round pick on a quarterback, not to say this could be the quarterback of the future like they did with Jordan Love in the first-round pick. They were saying, we don't know if Aaron's the guy or not. We better take multiple swings, which is a very smart way to handle the quarterback room. You see them doing it in New England, and they're – you know, there's a quarterback controversy there right now. They won again yesterday. Everybody likes to laugh and say they're a horrible team. They're five and four now. They're putting it together, right? But they've they've had a little bit of a quarterback rotation there between Mac Jones and and Bailey Zappi now. And um, you got to take multiple swings. It's the most valuable asset in the entire NFL is the quarterback position. Why would you not take multiple swings? This draft coming up, if indeed 
the Packers coaching staff does not know if Jordan Love is the guy. And I, I think they do not know yet. And that's my personal side. I could be wrong. They may be sitting there just like Mike McCarthy, and then we're going, oh, man, we got us a real one here. Because there was nobody talking about Aaron Rodgers being the next great Hall of Fame quarterback. I'm sorry. I remember. I've got the tweets. I've got all that. None of the media was going, Aaron Rodgers is a real deal, man. When Brett leaves, this team's going to take off. Nobody was saying that. Now, the second he did, boy, they were all over him, right? And then the second he made some other decisions, they completely turned on him. But that's a story for a different type of podcast. But anyway, Mike McCarthy coming in. He's coming in to Lambeau next week. Prime time. We laughed about it on the post game show, and I got a lot of feedback from that. It was funny. I actually tweeted out a clip of it, just seeing Ryan and Jacob's reaction. It's like they they in in the fog of war of watching this horrible Lions performance, right against the Lions, they realize, oh crap, Mike McCarthy's coming in here with the Dallas Cowboys. And I think they're six and two or whatever it is, right? It's a heck of a coach, guys. Heck of a coach. I, when he when he went to Dallas, I wasn't one of them going, oh, he'll fall flat on his face. I was going. As long as he doesn't give the reins too much to that offensive coordinator and he makes this his project, they're going to win games. Jerry Jones is going to give him what he needs. You know, some people would say Jerry Jones is too hands on when it comes to the roster and this and that. I'm sorry, guys. Jerry Jones drafted Micah Parsons. <laughs> like, they, you know, where did Tony Pollard come from? Tony Pollard's another gym, right? CD Lamb, great wide receiver. On and on and on, right? Um, so with Mike McCarthy coming in, all I want to say is I appreciate everything he did for Green Bay. I'm going to play a little clip here. I want you guys to hear how emotional he got when he was asked this question. And it was tweeted out. It said, Cowboys head coach Mike McCarthy got emotional when asked what he misses most about Green Bay. And I want you to hear what he said. Listen real close to what his answer is when he was asked this question. The question again was, what do you miss the most about Green Bay? I mean, a lifestyle in Dallas, Texas is incredible. I mean, this has been an incredible, incredible opportunity for us as a family. But, you know, uh, Jessica was born there. Kids were born there. <laughs> so, people. Miss the people. One more time. This has been an incredible, incredible opportunity for us as a family. But, you know, uh, Jessica was born there. Kids were born there. <laughs> So people, miss the people. People, I miss the people. He got emotional, couldn't even talk, right? Couldn't even talk. All the people that had him ran out of town, right? Man, not the majority, but, you know, there was some pretty nasty. I remember I was thinking, man, why do they hate this guy so much? And he says to people, guys, he's not talking about Mark Murphy. Mark Murphy fired him. He's not talking about Brian Gutekunst. Brian Gutekunst, you know, was right there along the way, right? Ted Thompson was, you know, kind of dealing with his mental ailments there with his his mental health, uh, you know, I don't, I don't even know the, the proper way of saying it without being rude, but, you know, his, his mind started to take a toll, you know, his mental health went downhill quick. But he's not talking about Matt LaFleur. He's not talking about Stenovich, right? He's not talking about Joe Barry. Those guys weren't here. So who is he talking about the people? Again, I'm going to play it one more time. You know, uh, Jessica was born there. Kids were born there. <laughs> so, people. Miss the people. People. I miss the people. Guys, who he's talking about is you. Everybody hearing my voice right now. Packer Nation. He was talking about the people of Green Bay the fans of Green Bay, the community of Green Bay, which you can find it all over, all all over the internet, all the great things he's done in that community. Still has a home there, right? His wife is from there. He raised his kids there. When he's talking about the people, he's talking about you. He's talking about Packer fans. They're, you know, the, the fans that are hearing my voice that are around my age, anywhere from 25 to 45 years old, he's talking about their parents that he got a chance to interact with there. The diehard Packer fans that made it through the 70s and the 80s and then stepping in the 90s when we finally got back to the glory years, right? He's talking about the fans. He's talking about you. So if you're going to Lambeau on Sunday, right, heck, even at your house watching the game, let's put some respect on his name. Like, seriously, 
The man brung you a Super Bowl championship. The man literally hand-molded Aaron Rodgers into the efficient quarterback, protecting the football, beat that into his head over and over and over. He made him the quarterback that he is today. Aaron put in the time, the work, don't get me wrong. But Mike McCarthy took this organization in, in the midst of Brett Favre, too, basically saying, I don't want to play here anymore, and finagling his way all the way into Minnesota. I, I know, boy, we're cutting deep now. We're getting to <laughs> some of the bad memories. He pulled the organization out with a young quarterback who was unproven and went and got us a Lombardi Award. And then he stands on that podium and he's asked, what's Green Bay mean to you? What do you miss the most? And he says, the people, the fans. He's talking to you guys. So on Sunday, if you're in Lambeau, how about we give him a freaking standing ovation because he earned it. He deserves it. He deserves the respect of Packer fans until that whistle blows for the first quarter. And at that point, all bets are off, baby. Take the gloves off, go out there, smack them around, and let's see if we can get a W. And that's right. I'm not in the tanking corner. I'm not the guy over here going, well, maybe we should lose games and get a better draft pick. Guys, we could lose every game from here on out. And when we get to week 18, I'm going to be going, let's go out there and get a dub. Because just like John Madden said, when John Madden told, I think I understood correctly, it was actually the Giants coach at the time. He said, thank you for going out and winning that game rather than just trying to get a better draft pick. Or I think it was actually to give them an easier opponent in the next round of the playoffs, whatever it was. He said, the second that – Every single snap, every single game that the NFL has played is not about winning, then we don't have a game anymore. And that's what it's going to be, man. Just like uh, the emailer said tonight. Brooke, I believe it was. I don't have the email pulled up anymore. The emailer said, ride or die. That's, that's it. All the way. So, again, thanks Mike McCarthy for everything he did. Give him the respect he earned that he deserves, give him that standing ovation when he comes out. And then when that whistle blows, let's go out there and thump some heads to take care of the Dallas Cowboys. So appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us today. I uh, hope you guys, this, this will be dropping at noon on Tuesday, so I hope you guys are having a great work day. Um, you know, do me a favor. Go out and make somebody smile today, man. Encourage somebody, a stranger, compliment them. You know, pay, when you're in, in the line at Starbucks or the fast food place tomorrow, Pay for the guy's lunch behind you, the family's lunch behind you, the, the, the lady's lunch behind you, right? Let's take care of one another. Let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. Go Pack Go.